And maybe we saw uh, Molly will start to moderate the panel. It would be great maybe to hear a few words from John who brought us all here together. <coughs> Uh, one interesting thing that comes through the disparate talks is, uh, could you hear me? Uh, one interesting thing that comes through in these talks is what happens when you drop the word biology into a conversation uh, in Helena's world uh, or in Steve's classroom in medical school. Uh, uh, in terms of extinction, uh, it, one thing that's extinct for a lot of people is science itself. And uh, I was interested in an article I read about your experiences in the classroom, you know, and uh, if you care to talk about it or not. Uh, and Helena, I've heard on the radio debating uh, people about uh, the just, you know, Distinction yeah, of sex differences. Sure. And, I mean, and it seems like what, what happens is, uh, what happened in 1975 was, starting with the work of Robert Trivers, was the introduction of what became known as a realistic biology of mind. The idea that we're mammals, we can be studied the way we study mammals, and uh, we're biological entities. And uh, a lot of people have a problem with that. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I mean, I think you're talking about a specific and slightly unfortunate interaction which a lot of biologists in this country have had, which is um, strong resistance by particular religious groups to being told about evolution. And I refer at UCL, which is a very heterogeneous bunch of students, um, to, uh, to, uh, to Islamic students who, uh, who send in petitions and uh, write letters saying they shouldn't have to listen to talk about evolution. Um, my response to that is, you know, you can't do biology without listening to evolution. It's like, uh, it's like doing English and not, not doing English, not believing in grammar, or doing physics and having doubts about gravity. It doesn't work. Um, so that is a concern. In some ways, there's a matching and more subtle concern, which I think is more important. There is, among many educated people, and many people of a liberal persuasion, and I would like to think I'm at least one of those, have one of those attributes, um, uh, an unwillingness to accept the facts of biology. Um, the, the, it is the case, as Helena um, suggested to us, that although it's grossly overstated, there are biological differences between males and females in many ways, in behavior and other things. They're used unfairly. There, are, there is a heritability of intelligence, um, which, and you only have to say that, and the heaven falls upon you, mainly because people don't understand what the word heritability means. It means far less than what the papers tell you it means. I don't know why anybody wants to study heritability at all. It's almost a meaningless statistic. So I think the answer about science is science stands by itself. It doesn't care what people think about it. Um, you know, the, the universe didn't care about the Inquisition. It went, c c continued circling around. And genetics is, li genetics is like that. I mean, genetics is, is a scientific way to make sex boring, okay? That's what, that's what I do professionally. And we discover things that may be uncomfortable. But if they're uncomfortable, too bad. I think the morals have to be put on one side. So I think that's the issue. People are unwilling to accept the truths of science on ideological grounds. And it doesn't really matter what the ideology is. It's the w unwillingness to accept the truth I don't like. Mm -hmm. Helena, did you want to add to that? Um, yes, there, there is a problem about the ideology and its winning. Because, um, for example, policy making is entirely made on the grounds that Male, males and females are the same. And roughly speaking, if females aren't the same as males, then it's because they're being held back in some way. And so there are all sorts of attempts to get 50-50% in engineering, for example, which is ludicrous because on average, on average, there is much less interest in that sort of area. I'm not talking about ability, just less interest. And similarly, um, one of the most egregious examples I came across recently, which I'll share with you just for the fun of it, was the Institute of Physics of all institutions, which, of course, started off um, its recent report with the idea that we need 
more engineers, more physicists, more hard scientists. Yes, of course, we all agree with that. And then they notice that there aren't as many women as men doing it. And then the problem suddenly changed halfway through the report. And it ended up in an Institute of Physics report with suggesting that couldn't we shift more males over into the humanities and so on and say we'll get more 50-50. Even if very few women are doing uh, engineering, uh, there'll be so few men there anyway, so that it'll be more evened up. Now that's a kind of madness. I know this sounds like, as if it can't be true, but that's the kind of madness you get when you're trying to impose an ideology that assumes you must have sameness, otherwise you can't have fairness. You can have fairness and you should be treated fairly on the grounds of who and what you are, and you don't have to be the same as anybody else in order for that to happen. Can I just push you a little bit on that? Um, because I think you've made a really compelling case that a lot of the differences that we see in, in gender distribution and different career pathways are naturalistic. They seem to be evolved traits that were in response to some sort of selective process. Yes. But of course, in philosophy, there's this sort of famous notion that what is, you can't derive an ought from an is. And I want to ask you about the ethics of this. I, I wonder just sort of um, what are the implications of your research for the more ethical question about what should be, we be trying to encourage? And, and, and also related to this idea that you know, having more homogeneity in, in anything is, is, is detrimental to the survival of an idea, of a field. and so. I'm just wondering sort of how the ideas about how things are are related to how they should be. I, I entirely agree with you about keeping that distinction, and that's why I, it, I feel it's so important that we understand, as Steve said, the difference between science and ideology. Um, but from the point of view of what we should encourage, well, we should encourage things that, for example, we need, like we need more doctors, if we need more engineers, we should encourage it. But then we should encourage people to be doctors or engineers. What we don't want to do is discourage anybody who wants to, has a real interest and wants to do something. And that's a woman being an engineer or a man doing something typically feminine. And it's a very, very simple thing. Um, but the planning of what you need in a society and which people you encourage to go for it are two different things. Great. Um, I had a question actually, which I think probably many of the people on this panel could answer in, in different ways, and that's to do with the extinction of ideas. I think a lot of talks touched on this, and of course John has recently hosted at EDGE um, uh, the EDGE question about, about what scientific ideas are ready for retirement. And, and Chiara, during your talk, you, you, you spoke a lot about, about how knowledge can survive and be resilient, and it seemed like your theories were touching on on what makes an idea survive. And I'm just wondering if, if you could turn this on its head a little bit and, and talk about how an understanding of resilience and survival might inform us of how certain ideas that maybe shouldn't survive do survive and, and sort of fail to die. You know, you, you mentioned um, creationism, and I'm sure there have been talks today about, about climate change denial. Um, so I'm just wondering what, what can we get theoretically? There's um, also very credible ideas like string theory uh, that may or may not be uh, worth, worth retaining, but they're mainstream. Yeah, so I'm you just know. curious your thoughts on that. So we're not that. just talking about creationism. Yeah. Uh, I think ideas um, and knowledge in general uh, are to be judged in terms of how many problems they can solve. And uh, it could be the case that certain ideas that um, appear to be wrong to some of us um, haven't been really put at the, you know, they, they haven't shown the fact that they are really parochial and they can't solve certain problems. So I think one should just uh, uh, insist on uh, criticism, criticizing those ideas and showing, uh, you know, by watertight arguments that there are problems that they can't solve. And possibly that sometimes they are the very reasons why we get stuck on a problem. And um, also, there's an interplay between the reason why we are, uh, you know, certain ideas that seem to be wrong are resilient and our background knowledge. And this connects to the um, uh, phenomenon by which, uh, you know, despite our um, moral standards uh, having improved, 
uh, we still have certain phenomena like uh, you know the fact that apparently uh, uh, women are you know a minority yet in, in um, scientific subjects well that's just because there are certain ideas that haven't been uh, criticized uh, well enough and uh, I, I think it's just part of the progress that humanity does uh, criticizing them but in a sort of pacific way and without seeing conspiracies anywhere. So moving from the criticism ideas to the criticism of cultural practices or the practices of companies, I'm just wondering, Jennifer, if you could tell us your thoughts on whether there's anything fundamentally different about the extinction versus resilience of ideas versus cultural practices and things, behaviors that might harm the environment. I think it'd be very hard, for me at least, to separate those two things categorically. I mean, maybe you have a different sense, but just that uh, so much of what we practice is based on ideology. So uh, maybe there are certain things that are unlikely to go away, like a desire to gain prestige. Uh, but how that manifests itself, I think, does change very much over time. So uh, we maybe can recognize what some people would call like the meta norms, uh, but then also recognize that within that meta norm, ideas, uh, practices change constantly. And so I think that uh, it'd be it's maybe a more an area like that you're dealing with would be something about how do we go up against people who say that this is a cultural tradition that shouldn't go extinct and it's at odds with extinction itself. And that is a very sensitive and difficult area that I think science has a pretty big role, but values ultimately will come into play. Uh, Jennifer, what, what, what happens when you do an experiment and you get a result that's contrary to the values you push it? What do you mean? In, uh, you well, mean it it me seems or? like you, you know the answer before you do the experiment. Who, who, you as in me, or well, one? In terms of the work you're doing, <laughs> science is, you, you run experiments and you find out, you know, are they false, are they true, right. are they not true? Uh, you have an agenda, so is it science? So and, and what happens if you do an experiment and it, it gives you the, the answer that's contrary to what you're espousing? Culturally, I, I mean, I guess the, the, I guess you're trying to make the distinction that some people don't have an agenda, but I, it's not clear to me that's the case. It's not clear to me that um, anybody is entirely removed from the values of their discipline or their field, and so I really can't, I can't really. Uh, and the, again, the philosophers that I work with, I think, have pointed this out so many times that. Uh, every discipline has its own sort of indoctrination process into what you have to believe for things to proceed. I think it's really important to realize that whatever your agenda is, if you want to achieve it, you've got to really know how the world is. It's no good trying to shape the results of your experiments to your agenda. If, if you find something contrary to your agenda, that's going to be extremely useful for you. Science just tells you the way the world is. It can tell you how to kill somebody, it can tell you how to keep them alive. And that doesn't say whether you're a murderer or a doctor. And there's a, a phrase from, um, from Bateson, who was a, an early geneticist, and he said, treasure your exceptions. Yes. And that's a really important thing to say in science, because uh, he bred fruit flies. Now, when I'm breeding fruit flies, I'm doing, a, doing a, an experiment with students. Now and again, things go wrong. Bottle number 1,210 doesn't give you the right result. So what I invariably say, nearly all scientists say, damn, I, 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 uh, another fly got in, or I labeled it wrong. So you throw it away. And of course, that's the last thing you should do. That's the biggest treasure you've got, is the exception. And that's a thing which is very hard to get on board. You do have an agenda. The famous case, which... Uh, more than one person on this panel will know much more than I do, was, the, uh, was Lord um, Kelvin, I think it's Kelvin, yeah, who yes. said in 1904 to Britain's physicists, uh, give up doing physics, it's all done. We understand yeah. it, go and do something more interesting. The next year, quantum mechanics, um, uh, relativity, physics in effect collapsed. Now there was a huge resistance to that, 
But in the end, um, uh, everybody said, all right, you're right, gov, we have to start again from the beginning. And that's what you have to do. I have to tell you, I think I'm looking forward to the headline sometime in the near future, which says, DNA is not the genetic material. That's actually much closer than most people think. DNA is a, a small part of the machine. We have all the influences being on it. DNA may turn out to be unimportant. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, mm -hmm. If only you could strip people of their Nobel Prizes, but you can't. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Steve. It, it's interesting. Uh, at one of the Edge master classes, there's a two-day debate, Daniel Kahneman, uh, taking on everybody about climbing. And he finally said, belief is not an option. It's based on the facts. But two weeks ago and two years later, after uh, these various studies showed that uh, some of the primary studies are uh, not as solid as people thought they were, he's backtracking. Mm -hmm. So, which backs up what Jennifer's talking about. Well, I think that my, my other addition I would add to that is that I think the true scientific spirit, which was exactly what you're saying, is open to revision. And so I would never, on the basis of one experiment, accept some sort of dogmatic approach to anything. And if you're not open to revision on any idea, and I think the physical sciences are a little less open than the social sciences, which have to be very open because human behavior is so varied and culturally dependent, um, that's the problem, is if you're not open to revision on an idea. Now Thanks the bad to... news is that we are out of time. The good news is that this wonderful conversation can continue. It can continue, of course, on Edge and also on Extinctly. And I really wanted to thank Chiara and Helena and Jennifer and Molly and Steve and John. Thank you so, so very much. And thanks to Edge.